بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد So I just want to uh, recap a few things that uh, you guys probably covered last week without going into too much detail. Uh, first of all, Surah Al-Jumu'ah, uh, it was revealed in Medina. And one of the things to remember and to keep in mind concerning the Madani Surahs is that they were revealed in the presence of the Jews. Uh, and this was the first time that the Jumu'ah was being initiated and obligated. And this is what we find in the initial verses of the Surah and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses his own greatness and how we should be in awe of him, Azza wa Jal. And even in this awe and this greatness, he, out of his infinite mercy, sent down a messenger. And not only did he send down any messenger, he sent out a messenger who was from them, who was from amongst the Arab. He was not a stranger. He was somebody who they all knew, who they were all familiar with. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes off after giving this uh, this quick introduction of an example of those that disobey him and who disobey the messenger who he chose for them, who was from them. And this is this parallels very closely and very similarly to the story of Musa. Musa being from Bani Israel, he was from them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him for them. So similarly for the Arab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, who was for them and who was also from them. So he azza wa jal goes on to directly address the Jews in these in these closing verses of Surah Al-Jumu'ah and uh, the first ayah or the first verse of discussion for the evening is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ هَادُوا إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَا لِلَّهِ مِنْ دُونِ النَّاسِ فَتَمَنَّوْا الْمَوْتِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Say, you who follow the Jewish faith, if you truly claim that out of all people, you alone are friends of Allah, then you should be hoping for death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a, a very interesting statement here telling our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to address the Jews directly, telling them that you truly believe, or if you truly believe you are the chosen people, then you should hope for death. And the reason that the Jews believed that they were the chosen people was number one, because their scripture tells them that they are the chosen people. And also, as they saw the Sharia, as they saw the Islamic law being descended onto Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were many similarities that they were actually seeing and finding, uh, including that the first Qibla of the Muslims was toward Bayt al Maqdis, uh, or what is modern day Jerusalem, and how the Jews saw that and they took this as a sign of pride that you know their religion was still being sanctified to an extent. So they they claimed this and they saw that the Muslims were following pretty much in their footsteps a lot of these canonical laws. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually changed the Sabbath from Friday as a way to chastise them and to show them that no, not all of the rulings that are coming down to the Muslims are the same. They are actually different from what you teach and what you are calling to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls what these individuals are saying a claim. So over here they're saying, in za'amtum annakum awliya, that if you truly claim that out of all people, you alone are the friends of Allah, you are the awliya of Allah. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he calls this a claim. And again, he's doing this to chastise them in order to belittle them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his chastisement, he follows this with a challenge saying that, okay, if you truly believe that you are Allah's awliya, if you are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's friends and chosen people, then hope for death. And the reason they he's telling them to hope for death is because, okay, if you're Allah's chosen people, then you should not have any problems in terms of accountability when you die, meaning that you will go straight to paradise because you are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's awliya. And the reality is, is that they realize that they are no different from anyone else and that they have no specific virtue, nor are they better than anyone else. And this is why they themselves know that this is nothing but a claim. All of this is, is a claim. Uh, there is no truth behind this claim at all, because even us, even the Muslim, 
with the understanding that we are on the correct religion, with the understanding that Islam is the one true religion, we ourselves cannot guarantee paradise. Like we cannot guarantee paradise for ourselves as individuals. The only thing we can say is that yes, Islam is correct. Yes, you know, being a Muslim, a Muslim will enter paradise, but I cannot guarantee paradise for myself. And this is something that's very, you know, important to uh, to know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he promises and he follows in the next ayah by telling us, he says, But because of what they have stored up for themselves with their own hands, they would never hope for death. Allah knows the wrongdoers very well. And the reason they don't hope for it is because they themselves know the actions and wrongdoings that they have committed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he even calls them zalimin. He calls them oppressors, understanding that they are oppressing others and they are oppressing themselves <clears throat> by justifying certain actions. And this is for sure a, a type of oppression. And they themselves know that. And he's telling them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, he's telling us, saying that I know that you will never ask and never hope for death. You will never ask and you will never hope for death because of the accountability that will follow that. So it's it's very important for us to understand and for us to take this as an example because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by addressing them he's actually telling us and saying look at this example learn from it make sure that these are not the footsteps that you actually want to follow themselves so these individuals they know the actions and the wrongdoings that they have actually committed and which is why they don't hope uh, for this death which is why they don't hope to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they even understand, and this is something that even we understand as Muslims, that an individual who is a wali, a person who is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's awliya, he would never immerse himself in wrongdoings, right? He would never uh, oppress others. He would not immerse himself in sin. Uh, and this is not a, what a wali is. This is not, or these are not who the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are. Because the reality is, is that the wali is a pious believing worshiper very simply a wali is a pious believing worshiper not someone who is depraved not someone who is constantly in a state of sin does the wali sin absolutely yeah just like we all do but he is not in a constant state of sin which is what differentiates the wali from the one who is not because the wali like we said is the pious believing worshiper he is in a constant uh, awareness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when he sins or he makes a mistake he does his best to return to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, he does his best to make tawbah and to make istighfar and seek forgiveness for the mistakes that he had made and for the sin he had fallen into and one of the reasons that these individuals, they, they fear death or the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that they would never actually wish for death is because they would have to face punishment. And, and this punishment and this accountability is something that is obviously terrifying for someone who has immersed or who has spent their entire life sinning, uh, oppressing himself and oppressing others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to say, قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ So say, the death you run away from will come to meet you and you will be returned to the one who knows the unseen as well as the seen. He will tell you everything you have done. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them that they can never escape that punishment no matter how hard they try. So it, it's interesting if you look at the previous verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that they will never actively seek death. And, and in this verse, he says that you can never, never, you cannot actually and actively escape it. So while it's possible that we and we all do this is something that you know we all suffer from even even as as muslims and even as believers that death is something we're always putting off it's something that we always keep in the periphery of our vision it's not something we actively want to sit down and even ponder over even aisha radiallahu anha she said to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that even the believer even we hate death and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said yes you know this is something that's natural there's nothing that's wrong with you know hating death or fearing death the the one who wants to meet allah he even he fears death and even he dislikes death 
but uh, the the purpose here is that he's Allah subhanahu wa taala is reminding them time and time again, not just because of not just the death in and of itself, which is terrifying, you know, for everyone obviously, but he's reminding them of the accountability that follows follows that, um, and he's reminding them that okay, there might have been a lot of time from the times that you commit. Uh, there might have been a lot of time that has passed since you committed these crimes and it's very possible and it happens with us also that we might have made a mistake we might have committed a sin and we completely forgot about that sin that we committed and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forget us of those sins that we remember and those that we forgot I mean it's, it's very possible that I forget that I committed a par particular crime. It's very possible that I committed a particular sin. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them that while you may have forgotten, I have not. Allah does not forget anything. And he keeps the all of these things recorded and he will show it to them. So the reminder in this ayah is twofold. And, and again, it's very important for us as Muslims to always look at these verses that talk about third parties and that talk about other groups to take these as personal lessons for ourselves. So the reminder, like we said here, there's, it's twofold. That there, there, there will be a resurrection. There will be a resurrection and death is not the final destination. This is not the purpose and this is not the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps saying death or keeps reminding us of death. He's reminding us that there will be a resurrection. And secondly, that after death, there will be accountability. There will be accountability. Every single one of us uh, will be questioned. And those actions that, that were done superficially and might apparently seem like they're good actions and might nor normally be rewarded, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands the true intention behind them. Because a person can superficially be doing a good action, but he can have ill intent and he can have ill will in his heart, not receiving any reward for that. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes saying that Alim al Ghaibi was shahada, yani that that world which is unseen and the world that is seen, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what it is that we do superficially, and he knows what our actual intent is in our hearts. And over here, he's talking you know, to, to these particular Jews, saying that I know what you do superficially and how you act, and I know what your intent is in your hearts. So this is unescapable and inescapable. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing time and time again uh, throughout these verses. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a, there's a shift in tone here. There's a shift in tone here after completing his discussion uh, of, of these particular Jews. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, idha nudiya lissalati min yawm al-jum'ati, jum'ati, fas'au ila dhikri allahi wa dharu al-bayya, thalikum khayrul lakum in kuntum ta'lamun, fa'idha qudiyati salatu, fantashiru fil ard, wabtagu min fadli allah, wadhkuru allaha kathira la'allakum tuflihun. Believers, when the call to prayer is made on the day of congregation, on the day of Jum'ah, hurry toward the reminder of Allah and leave off your trade. That is better for you, if only you knew. Then, when the prayer has ended, disperse in the land and seek out Allah's bounty. Remember Allah often so that you may prosper. And this verse is the actual buildup. This, this, this verse right here is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed the previous verses for so that they would actually build up to this verse and build up to this obligation and the importance of this day that was coming up. And again, like I had mentioned in the beginning, that the Sabbath for the Jews was on Saturday, right? The Sabbath was on Saturday. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving us that entire introduction from the beginning of the surah up until the through the discussion of the jews now he's talking about the the uh the uh final result of what that introduction was which is the establishment of the obligation of the friday prayer and establishing the juma itself um, but just a side note concerning Juma itself, you know, uh, it is said that Musab ibn Umar, he was the first individual to actually establish Juma in Medina. What the Prophet Sallallahu had done before the Hijrah, he actually told him and he appointed him to go and to uh, lead the people in Juma in Medina. Uh, the first Juma that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually prayed it was at a masjid, the Masjid of Bani Salim. Uh, the Juma was obligated with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the, the the day he arrived in Medina, uh, a few days later it was Friday. He actually uh, that's when the obligation for the Juma came. Because many of the scholars speak about these different Jumas, 
<clears throat> that happened before the khutba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said that all of these it, it had not become an obligation at that point it was still uh, something that was the sunnah but when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came uh, it was an obligation uh, how the Jummah happens, and uh, many of us, if not all of us, are familiar with it, is that it takes the place of Salat al uh, The scholars say that the khutbah takes the place of the first two rakah, and the khutbah actually takes the place of the last two rakah, which is why there is a break for the, khut, um, for the khutbah. You know, you have the first khutbah, you have the second khutbah, and then you have the two rakah for the salah in and of itself. Uh, so they say this is how the four is, is broken down. Additionally, <clears throat> the Jum'ah prayer is read out loud, uh, which is something that is different from the Dhuhr prayer, so that the people would benefit not only from the reminder that happens during the khutbah, but also from the recitation of the Qur'an, which happens during the uh, Salah itself. So then <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, closes the surah with uh, the verse saying wa idha ra'aw tijaratan aw lahwan faddu in faddu wa ilayha wa taraku ka qa'ima qul ma 'inda Allah khayrun min al-lahwi ma min at-tijara wallahu khayrur raziqin that yet they scatter toward trade or entertainment whenever they observe it and leave you standing there say Allah's gift or Allah's risk is better than any entertainment or trade Allah is the best provider so here the Prophet Sallallahu what is actually happening is that he was in the middle of the khutbah and the companions started leaving him. Uh, and there are two reasons that are mentioned in this verse where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala he says that wa tarakuka qa'ima wa idha ra'u tijaratan aw lahwa. Right, so they saw this trade or they saw entertainment. So the two of these things uh, were happening as they're mentioned in the verse. Uh, the first one is uh, in terms of trade. There was a caravan that had just come from the Sham region, uh, which is what is now modern day uh, Palestine, Syria and uh, Lebanon. And it was one of the major trade centers uh, because the Roman Empire had a large trade gathering there. So the Arab used to go there and they used to gather goods and then they used to bring them down and they used to trade them. So, uh, and one of the people who were overseeing this trade caravan was the head Al Kalbi, and what happened was that as soon as the caravan came in, the companions heard this and they left. And they left for the caravan, uh, and the reason that they left is because the 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 first goods that were sold were usually the best goods. So they were trying to make sure that they didn't lose these goods um, and they wanted to take advantage of that. The second reason, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, whether, they, whether they saw trade or they saw entertainment. So what would happen on, on Fridays is that uh, what sometimes the slave girls, they would marry. And whenever they would marry uh, the, these slave girls, they would play instruments uh, and they would play the, the skin drum. So you have a drum and you'd stretch skin over it. Uh, and, the, and the people, they would go and watch this. <clears throat> they would watch this as a form of entertainment. Uh, they will. Uh, they would. It would be a form of entertainment. So um, they would go and watch this. So, so these are the two reasons that they actually distracted. Uh, they were distracted from the uh, from the Juma khutbah. And there are many narrations that actually state that that everybody in the masjid left except twelve people. So the Prophet ﷺ was standing. He was giving khutbah. Everybody left. Uh, the only people that actually remained with him were uh, twelve. So. Um, Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he then closes this verse reminding them that, okay, I am the one that actually provides for you. I'm the one that has provided this trade. I'm the one that uh, provided this entertainment in the first place. And he has the ability to provide even better than that. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu khayru raziqeen, that he is the best of providers. And he's given you these things. There's something that's even better. And it, like we said, if we go back throughout the theme of this verse, <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with accountability. A lot of this has to do with accountability. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that enjoy these things. These are definitely means of enjoyment, but it's very important for you to establish your obligations first. And when these obligations are established, then you can even go, then I will provide a better form of trade and I will provide a better form of entertainment for you in the hereafter. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who is, are able to benefit from that trade and benefit from that entertainment in the hereafter. 
amin wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu ala khairi khalqin nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam inshallah the first question we studied at the beginning uh, of today's session um, the lesson that the jews were not prepared for death how can we stop ourselves from falling into the same and what should we be doing as muslims so that we don't fall into the same mistake and we we, we are indeed prepared for that. Mm -hmm. so the the first thing obviously we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and and we make dua you know I, I think this is one of the most powerful tools that we have as believers <clears throat> in the in the dua it, it is a multifaceted tool in the sense that by making dua number one i'm actively remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i'm actively remembering my inability and i'm remembering my weakness and i'm actually asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me something and it is very possible and it's highly possible that he will actually grant that thing to me so um it is definitely a multi multifaceted tool and i think uh, sometimes we we undermine it and we don't use it the way that we actually should so i think that would be the first thing the second thing is actually remembering death uh, and, and this is very difficult. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, actively uh, keeping our will in mind, making sure that uh, we we are preparing for our death, making sure that uh, we have left, you know, our our state clear, and understand how much it is that that we have and how much it is that we're leaving behind. Uh, visiting the grave, something the Prophet Sallallahu actually told us and reminded us to do, saying that you should visit the graves because it will remind you of death. Um, all of, all of these things, or even visiting the sick, uh, visiting those people who might be in hospice now, uh, who are you know who are transitioning and they're toward their the end of life. I mean, all of these things are, are great reminders uh, to the the brevity and the shortness of of our own lives, and it'll allow us to kind of keep those things in perspective. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Um, we talked about the term uh, wali. Mm -hmm. Um, can you describe what does the word wali mean? How sure. is it different from the term mu'min? Okay. Um, you know, what are the characteristics of a wali versus what are the characteristics of a mu'min? Mm -hmm. And if I want to become a wali of Allah, what do I need to do? What changes do I need to make in my life to try and become closer to um, to this? Okay. So um, this this is basically it would go back to what is a very famously known as the Hadith of Jibreel. And, and Islam has levels. You know, Islam has levels. Uh, not all of us are on the same level. Obviously, Abu Bakr is on a completely different level than the rest of the Ummah and the companions. You know, they they had levels amongst each other, uh, and we you know don't even stand in their shade. Uh, so it's very important for us to understand and break down, okay, what what is the thing that actually delineates and what differentiates us from them or us from each other? Uh, the first level is Islam. So an individual who is Muslim is somebody who accepts all of these pillars um, and very, very simply and very easily. The next level is the mu'min. The mu'min, this is where it's not just an acceptance of these superficial pillars. He has now internalized all of these different characteristics of belief. You know, he believes in Allah. He believes in his messengers. He believes in his books. He believes in his angels. Uh, he believes in, in the uh, Yom Al-Akhir. He believes in the Qadr. All of these things have now become internalized. The next step is the muhsin or the wali. And, and this person is how the Prophet Sallallahu he describes saying he is an individual who worships Allah as if he sees him. And if he is not able to see him, then at least he is constantly aware that Allah is watching him. And this is what the mu'min is. The, I mean, the, uh, the wali is and the muhsin is. The wali is someone, is the, the mu'min, he is the believer who is taqi the believer who is in a constant state of taqwa meaning that he does his best to constantly be aware of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has a strong god consciousness every action that he makes every smile every step he takes every time he gets into his car every time he sits down and fills out a form every time he's doing his work every time he sits down every time he gets up every time he drinks water this person is constantly in a state where he's remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is what a wali is that is what a wali is. It, it is not a station that is impossible to reach. It is a very achievable station. Uh, it is a very realistic means. It is just all it takes is a mindset. 
all it really takes is a mindset and that mindset is being constantly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always remembering him in the interactions that we have whether those interactions be within ourselves or whether they be with others wallahu alam jazakallah khair um we talked about uh, the importance of having forgiveness um you know seeking forgiveness from Allah for the sins that we've um, made uh, trying to remember those sins because as you said um, if we don't remember them Allah certainly will bring them forward um, in front of us what about um, seeking forgiveness for people um, there's one thing about seeking forgiveness from Allah uh, but what about seeking forgiveness for people how, how do we make sure that we haven't forgotten to do this Okay, so I would probably break this down to maybe two or three situations. Uh, the first situation is where I have access to that person. Uh, if I have access to that person, I am obligated now to go and seek for forgiveness from that person. Uh, there are two results that can come from this. Either the person can forgive me or he cannot, right? So he, he has a choice. Um, as for the person who does not forgive me, again, it is my obligation to do, do the best that I can in seeking that forgiveness um, and, and going through. Now, what happens usually in this situation, and, and it's quite unfortunate, is the person who is not willing to forgive, he has... A, some either some type of ego or stubbornness that will refuse him or not allow him to forgive that person uh, so in, in this situation that the person seeking the forgiveness he has actually fulfilled his responsibility he has gone forward he has lowered himself he has humbled himself out of full humility and gone to this person and went to seek forgiveness from him uh, so and if that person isn't granting it to him out of stubbornness then there is no fault on the individual who sought that forgiveness now, if there's an individual who might need more time, right, he might need more time and saying, hey, listen, I, I appreciate you've come seeking forgiveness from me. I just I don't think I can do that right now. It's not something I can deal with at this moment. Uh, but please, you know, I, I will definitely get back to you. I think this is part of the process. And I think these are the two reasonable ways to go forward, because sometimes it's very difficult to forgive immediately. Uh, forgiveness is a process. Uh, sometimes we forget that that our hearts are in constant turmoil and it's very easy for me to or it's very difficult for me to give up this my right concerning a particular issue and, and it is my right and this is something I, I want to make sure that I get across uh, to everyone that this is my right I do not have to forgive a person immediately I don't I, I, I don't I have that choice it is better for me if I do but I need to make sure that my heart is in the right place and I have to make sure that I'm doing it for the right reasons and if I need to wrestle with my heart to make sure that I do come to terms and I do come to the right reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward me for that effort that I'm making in order to forgive that person um, or it could be a situation where a person not out of stubbornness not out of ego they sincerely just don't want to forgive that person maybe that person there's there's rape involved uh, maybe there was murder involved uh, maybe there was stealing of rights that were involved that were irreplaceable uh, that every situation differs but upon the person who's wronged someone else and he has access to him his obligations to go and seek that forgiveness um, the second type of person is a person I don't have access to. Maybe I wronged him on a one-off occasion and I never saw him again. I never saw her again. In that situation, I have to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I have to ask him to forgive me to the point where I feel like I have fulfilled that person's right. So I, and sometimes this is very difficult because it's, it's a very intangible thing in terms of seeking forgiveness from someone who is not there, someone who I don't have access to, because there are two types of people who I have access to complete strangers who there's a very good chance I'll never see that person again, or I got into a fight with that person and that person passed away. Um, so in both of these situations, I have to keep seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until my heart is at ease. And when my heart is at ease, uh, at that point, again, I'm, I'm, I can always seek istighfar and I can continue seeking that. But that that itmanan or that that ease that I'm feeling in my heart should be a sign, and it can be a sign for that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has actually accepted my tawbah. Allahu Akbar. Jazakallah. Um, sometimes people don't pay attention to the kutbah of Juma. Do they lose the blessing of Juma? Uh, they lose part of the blessing. They lose part of the blessing. They don't lose the entire blessing of Jummah because they're physically still there. Um, but it also depends on what situation that person is in. And we also, you know, many times it's easy for us to attack attack the person who is sitting for the khutbah. It's very easy for us to attack the ma'mum. 
uh, the person who's sitting there and who's following, but it's it's very rare for us to actually look at the khatib. Okay, is the khatib talking about something relevant? Uh, is he giving an appropriate khutbah? How long a khutbah is he giving? Uh, I, I think the, this is a relationship that is um, that needs to be really looked at. We need to make sure that the khatib is doing his full best in trying to present a proper khutbah, and the the makhtub or the person who's being addressed that he's doing his his full best in trying to pay attention. Sometimes, you know, there's just a lapse where an individual is trying to pay attention and he is trying to, you know, listen to what the khatib is talking about. But maybe, you know, there's bill issues or there are medical issues. And sometimes, you know, we do get distracted. And, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for those lapses. But if I'm making a full effort to not listen to the Juma khutbah at all, then that Juma is definitely lost, just like my salah would be lost if I was in the same situation. And Allah knows best. Obviously, the day of Juma is a very blessed day. What should we be doing more of to try and reap the benefits of the day of Juma to the to the maximum? And the sending salah and salam on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's that that is the best way to spend that day. And what are the other things we should be doing dur during this day? Uh, so, so some of the ulama talk about reading so reading Surah Al-Kaf. Uh, some of them talk about making du'a uh, because it is a day that du'a is accepted. Uh, and there's an hour in that. And there's a lot of different uh, narrations. There are a lot of different uh, understandings of when that hour actually is. Some of them say when the khatib sits down. Some of them say in the last hour of the day, you know, before the sun sets. Uh, some of them say at the asr time itself. Um, but it is it is a time, like I said, the best thing to do on that day, sending salah and salam on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, actively making uh, du'a, but even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the verse himself that you go back, you know, go back for, to your tijara, go back to your business after the Juma Salah is over um, and, and take advantage of the day. Take advantage of the day. Um, we, our Sabbath is is not like other Sabbaths. You know, we, we have the time frame is the khutbah time. That is the time that we are not allowed to do business before and afterward. We are open to do that. So taking advantage of the day, both spiritually uh, and economically and socially, is something that is very healthy and uh, everyone should do. JazakAllah. Are, legit, are there legitimate reasons to miss the Juma uh, Qutbah and the Juma Salah? And if so... Can you review what those reasons and exceptions to missing the salah are? Okay. Uh, well, the general ones, like so if an individual is traveling, uh, if an individual is in jail, uh, if an individual is sick, uh, all of these are reasonable uh, things to prevent a person from going to Juma. Uh, so he does not have to attend uh, the Juma. So even if I'm traveling, for example, to to Kenya, or I'm, a tra I'm traveling to Senegal, or I'm traveling to Egypt. As a traveler, I am not obligated to pray Juma. I have a choice. I can if I want to, but I'm not obligated uh, to pray Juma because I'm traveling. Um, the other other things that are other reasons that might prevent an individual from praying Juma. So, for example, if an individual has an exam and an exam is only being offered at that Juma time, uh, I would allow that person. I would excuse that person from uh, attending Juma uh, because it's not something again that's happening regularly on both ends. Meaning that he himself is actively not trying to miss Juma, and this exam is only being offered at that time, unfortunately. And. Along the same um, theme of missing the Juma, um, can you clarify the ruling on missing three Jumas and how serious is this missing three Jumas in a row? Mm -hmm. And does this mean it's okay to miss two, or you know what's the severity yeah. of this one? So, so basically, the Prophet ﷺ, he he was just trying to warn the individual who was consecutively missing Jumas, meaning that he is not actively making an effort to to come to the Juma prayer. So you know we have people, for example, who come late consistently to the Juma. Uh, so in the, in those situations are where we have people who are consistently coming late, it's very important to reanalyze the reasons of why it is that I'm coming late. So when even when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that about the person who misses three Jumas and, and the severe um, chastisement that came concerning that, 
he's always lamented as a chastisement meaning as a warning to that person like okay there's something wrong so you really need to reanalyze yourself you really need to reanalyze you know your your life at this point on why it is that you are consistently missing these friday prayers it is not meant as a means to excommunicate him from from the muslim community it is not means uh, a means for that person to excommunicate him even from islam and say that no now he's outside the fold of islam no that's that's not what is meant uh, in the in the hadith the meaning behind it is is that there is a severe chastisement and a severe warning for that person because he is being lax and again this is a person who is actively missing a person who's actively missing not a person who might have overslept three jumas in a row uh, that that's a different situation um, but if if he has, then it's very important for him, again, to reanalyze his intention, reanalyze himself or herself and see, OK, what it is that I can do to really rectify my situation so that I can start attending Juma again. But even missing one Juma, this is not this is not acceptable. It's an obligation. It's an obligation on every male, on every man. Um, there is not an excuse to miss even one. Um, so, but like I said, the Prophet he, he used three as an example to show that this person is con making it a habit. He's turn it's turned into a bad habit where he's consistently and actively missing these Jumas now. So he has to really reanalyze himself and fix that the situation that he's in. Okay. Can Juma be done with three people outside the masjid or must we be inside the masjid? So I'm not sure the context of this question and whether it's referring to arriving at the masjid late and the yeah. Juma or whether it's in, independent of the timing of the Juma in the masjid. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> there is khilaf on the on the location. Uh, in general, there though there is an agreement that Juma can be held outside. Uh, there's a difference of opinion over a rented space, uh, whether Juma can be held in a rented space or not, and whether it can be held in. Uh, obviously, if it's an own space, then there is a general agreement that a person that Juma can be established. But um, if if a person is coming to the masjid, the masjid has closed because the salah is over, everybody's gone home, uh, and asr hasn't started yet. Can these people make Juma outside? And if there's three of them, uh, yes, there are opinions that that would allow that. Uh, every madhab has a different minimum requirement and a different minimum number, uh, but the least allowed is three, um, and the the most minimum requirement is forty. So um, as long as you have a jama, uh, and that's the basic reasoning behind it, as long as you have three people, you are welcome to make Juma uh, at that point, even if it is outside the masjid because the masjid is locked for whatever reason. Or if you go into the masjid and you find that the Juma is over, uh, having a second Juma, um, again, if there was a need for it, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. I don't see an issue with it. Allah, Akbar.